in 2012, Harim al Nubi was a 28 year old young man, seemed to be in reasonably good health, and he lived in Egypt and worked in the southern part of Egypt as a waiter. And on this particular day, uh, he woke up and got ready like any other day and went to his job where he was eager to serve the customers who would be present in the, uh, the place where he worked as a waiter. And so he goes about his day. Everything seemed normal. Everything seemed like a typical day. And sadly, Harim al Nubi, as a 28-year-old man, suffered a heart attack and died. His, his family is just devastated. 28 years old, they didn't see this coming. They didn't anticipate it. When it's somebody so young, you just, it's tragic. And so the, the family takes his body and uh, as they do in Egypt, they, they wash the body and they begin to prepare for the funeral and for the burial. And it's, it's a day or so after the heart attack when uh, they call in the doctor who has to come and just sign the legal death certificate. And so the doctor comes in and he prepares the paperwork and he goes, hmm, it's not typical for a body a day later to be warm. And so the doctor checks the pulse and he listens to the breathing, breathing checks the vital signs, and he goes, this guy's not dead. And, and so he calls a medic and the medic comes in and the doctor and this medic revive Harim al Nubi. He, he, uh, the vital signs were faint, but they were there. And he walked out and it says in the news article, when his mom saw him, she fainted. I mean, she was just beside herself. And, and what happened was what was going to be a funeral ce- celebrate or a funeral moment turned into this celebration of he, he wasn't dead after all. And so the family was rejoicing and it all changed because the doctor checked his vital signs. Now, the vital signs are signs of health that indicate that a body is functioning like it should, right? And and it looked like he he was dead, but when you checked the indicators, the signs of life, in fact, Harim al-Nubi wasn't dead, even though his pulse was faint and his breathing was very shallow, he was in fact very much alive. And so vital signs, when we talk about vital signs, it's just that it is the indicators of health that a body is functioning like it should. So when we call this series Vital Signs, it's because we want to look at, through the lens of the book of James, what are the indicators of a healthy spiritual life in us? What are the indicators that we're living and walking in maturity in Jesus in the way that Christ calls us to? That we're living and walking in Jesus in a life of healthy, mature faith. I think of Jesus' words. In Luke chapter 6, verse 43, Jesus says this. He says, no good tree bears bad fruit nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. He says, each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People don't pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And so out of that passage of verses, we might ask the question, how is your heart? Because Jesus says the things that are stored up in your heart are an indicator of of what comes out of your uh, mouth, are an indicator of the things that are happening in the recesses of your heart. And so when the pressure is on in life, when you feel the crises and stresses and the pressures of day-to-day living, what is the fruit of what comes out of your life? Because often that's what happens. It's when life gets hard and challenging, when the pressure is on, the things that come out of our life are an indicator of the things that we've been storing up in our life. And so if you begin to look at the fruit of your life, what does the fruit of how you're living say about what you've stored up in your heart? Because Jesus says what is stored up internally is going to come out in the fruit of your life. It's going to come out in the way that you speak because the mouth speaks, he says, what the heart is full of. So one of the core vital signs in our life is what of the fruit that comes out of our life? Is it the fruit of the spirit, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? Is it the kind of good fruit that Christ calls us to? This is a good vital sign indicator for our state of spiritual health. On the other side of vital signs, there are warning signs. There are indicators also of unhealth. And you know this in your life. You've experienced it. If you've gone to the doctor when you're not feeling well and the doctor looks at the symptoms and says, these are indicators that you're not well. And in the same way, scripture provides us with warning signs, with indicators that we are not spiritually well, that we are not spiritually mature, that we are still in need of the transforming work of Jesus. So in Colossians chapter three, 
which we looked at for the past four or five weeks as we talked about our mission statement, Paul gives us what I think are some warning sign indicators that we're not spiritually mature, that we're not spiritually well. So Paul says this in Colossians 3, verse 5. He says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Don't lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. And so Paul gives us what I think are warning signs, symptoms, indicators that we are not spiritually well. And and what is so striking to me about Paul's list is he he hits some of the big ones. He talks about worshiping idols. He talks about lust and evil desires and greed. But then Paul also talks about things like getting rid of anger and rage and slander and malice and filthy language. Right. And Paul begins to point to this fruit that is an indicator of a spiritual immaturity and spiritual unhealth. So again, I come back to that question, how is your heart? And I want you to reflect on that on a spiritual level. What kind of fruit is coming out of your life? Because there are symptoms and indicators, vital signs of spiritual health, and there are symptoms and indicators, warning signs of spiritual unhealth. And here's the thing, church, where there are vital signs and warning signs, in either case, we need to respond with urgency. There's a moment to push into maturity or there's a moment to say, Jesus, I need to surrender these things in my life that are not of you. I need to surrender them to you, Jesus. But urgency is vitally important. When my wife was uh, pregnant with our second child, uh, we were getting late in the pregnancy, you know, nine months along. And uh, she called me. I was working here at the church and she called and she said, hey, you know, I'm... I just, I'm not feeling too well today. I just feel off. So I said, okay. And uh, I was kind of texting her, checking in on her. And over my lunch break, I decided to run home. And she's kind of resting and relaxing, just trying to get her body to kind of settle a little bit. And being the helpful, thoughtful husband I am, I thought she probably wants the house to smell like bacon. Uh, so for whatever reason, I still, I don't know why. I think sometimes, sometimes as the dad, you don't really know what to do. So I decided to cook a pound of bacon, right? So she's resting and now she kind of like wants to puke because she's pregnant and the smell of bacon is not great. And so I'm in the kitchen cooking up a storm and she calls out, she goes, I think it's time. Right? And, and all the signs were there that, that labor was progressing, the water broke, the contractions are coming. And, and so this is our second child. I've been here before. This isn't my first rodeo. So I go, okay, we've got the bag packed. I get that in the car. And I, I, I go to her and I'm like, all right, let's go. And you guys, she's taking her sweet old time. And, and I'm thinking, I, the baby is coming. Like we should be moving. And she goes, hold You know, my boss doesn't know I'm gonna be out. Let me just put on my out of office auto reply. And I go, listen, this is the one time, it's like a get out of jail free card. When you have a baby, you can leave emails unanswered. You can do whatever because you're having a baby and she is just not in a hurry. The sense of urgency is low. So finally we get in the car and we're driving to Sioux Falls and she goes, you know, I think the contractions are getting a little closer together. And so at this time, like my, my panic meter is slowly, like it's rising and I'm driving the speed limit at this point on the interstate, uh, even though I want to speed and, and we get behind a police officer and I look at her and I go, I can call 911. Like this is the chance. Like you see in the movies, I'll tell him, Hey, my wife is pregnant. She's going to deliver. Can the officer lights on? Can he take us into the hospital? And my wife just goes, it's, it's fine. It was fine until we got off the exit into Sioux Falls. And she goes, I need to push. To which, again, the loving, gracious, kind husband I am, I go, well, you can't. As if, I mean, God has designed her body to deliver babies. And I'm going to tell her, like, you can't push. And now my panic meter is off the charts. And I start driving like a crazy person. At one point, I get stuck behind a school bus full of children. And I'm, I'm honking. And my wife grabs my arm and she goes, this doesn't need to be stressful. And I go, easy for you to say, I am about to deliver a child in our car. And in my mind, I'm, apolog- I'm like, sorry, kids, I love Jesus. I'm just terrified that I'm going to deliver a baby in our car. And so finally she goes, why don't you call the hospital and tell them we're coming? 
So I call the hospital and I say, listen, uh, we're coming. Uh, the baby is for sure coming. We need you guys to be ready. Yeah, yeah, okay, we'll be ready. I continue driving through Sioux Falls and invariably, the more in a hurry you are, the more traffic you hit. It's like a life rule or something. So we hit every red light. We hit every uh, traffic congestion point. And so I call the hospital again. I say, hey, listen, we're coming. I need you to be ready. Yes, yes, we'll be ready. I hang up the phone and uh, we get to the hospital and I run in and the lady at the front desk goes, you must be dad. And I was like, I, I don't think we have the same sense of urgency here, right? And I go, do you have a wheelchair? She goes, oh, we could probably find one for you. And I'm like, I'm like, I need, I need a wheelchair like three minutes ago. So we find a wheelchair and I get my wife and, and I bring her into the waiting room and she goes, okay, I've got this clipboard for you. If you'll just fill out your intake information. And at this point, I'm kind of praying, Lord Jesus, give me peace. Uh, I, I just want to let this uh, kind volunteer have it. And I go, ma'am, I'm really sorry. I don't have time. We can't fill this out. The baby is coming. At this point, my wife promptly stands up and says, I'm going to deliver this baby right here. <laughs> she calls a, a code OB and a midwife comes running out and we go into the elevator and my wife dives on the floor. And you guys, if you've seen a baby be born, like life is sacred, right? God has designed and created the body to, to give birth. And my wife is giving birth and I'm watching the beauty of the sanctity of life happen and unfold right there. And then the elevator goes back down bing, and the doors open. <laughs> And there, there's the foyer of the, the medical building. I don't know what to do, so I wave, right? Like, <laughs> hello. <laughs> and I'm crying, and the midwife is there, and the doors close, and we go back up. And everything was fine. Everything turned out great. But I go, this could have all been avoided if there was more urgency along the way. All the signs were there. We could see that labor was progressing. We could see that things were moving forward. But at every point where there should have been urgency, there was kind of a, a lackadaisical approach. And so here, here's the thing, church, when we see the signs of health, or we see the indicators, the symptoms of unhealth, it's vitally important that we act with urgency, right? Just as like the urgency of my wife giving birth, like that is significant. We need to be in a place where we can move towards proper care. The same thing is true spiritually, where you see the indicators of health. It's an opportunity to say, I need to push into spiritual maturity, where you see the symptoms of spiritual unhealth. It's a moment to say, I need to be intentional to surrender these things to Jesus, to act with urgency. And so what I want to do each week is I want to give us a vital sign check question. And this is just a reflection question for us to think through. How is my life on a spiritual level? And so here's the first vital sign check question I want to give us. Who are you serving and what are you seeking? Who are you serving and, and what are you seeking? And really behind this question is, is really the question of what are you pointing your life towards? What, what are the things that you are pursuing? What, what is a priority in your life? So as we unfold the book of James and as we walk through this together as a community, I, I want us to have that question in the back of our mind. So let's go to James chapter one, verse one. James says this. He says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Now, what I find fascinating is that James, who is the writer of, of the letter, he identifies himself as a servant. And what was so fascinating to me is that in, in ancient times, if you're writing a letter to a, a community of people, you would often write the letter and you would begin it with your claim to uh, influence. You, you would uh, include in the, the letter your title. Your position. You, you would want the community who's receiving your letter to know this is important and we should take it to heart. And so in an ancient letter, you would, you would write, you know, I'm a commander, I'm a general, I, I'm a governor. And yet James, as he writes this letter, he writes, I'm a servant. And, and what's so interesting to me is often when we read the letters in the New Testament, we jump right through the, the greeting. We want to get to the heart of the letter. But even in the greetings of these letters, the apostles are teaching us something. And, and I find it fascinating that James doesn't claim his authority. James says, no, I'm a servant. And, and James says, in fact, I am a servant of God and I am a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he, here's the thing, church. Here's what I want us to hold to. We are to live life serving Jesus submitted to his authority. We are to live life as a servant submitted to the authority of Jesus and serve him. 
Because when you think about what a servant is and what a servant does, a servant doesn't come in their own authority. No, the servant says, I come as a representative of the one who does have authority. And so where James says, I am a servant of God, what he's saying is that God is in control and I have submitted my plan, my purpose, my priorities to his authority. So James is not writing in his own strength, his own influence, his own power. James says, no, 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 I'm pointing to the God who has sent me in his plan, his purpose, and his priority are ultimately what's important. And, and what I find interesting is that James says, not only am I a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus, notice that he uses two titles to describe Jesus. He says that Jesus is Lord. Now, to me... What makes this even more crazy is when you remember that James is the half-brother of Jesus. Now, if you have siblings, you would know how hard it would be in some cases to acknowledge a sibling as someone of authority in your life, right? Imagine you're the younger brother, you're the younger sister, and you go, oh yeah, I, I serve under the lordship of my sibling, right? You'd go, no, there's no way that's good. If I tried to tell my brothers, I have two of them, hey, I want you to submit to my authority. They're like, hard pass, bro, not going to happen, right? <laughs> and yet here's James, who is the half-brother of Jesus, a half-brother because Mary is their mother, but God is the father of Jesus, and Joseph is the father of James, and yet James has the humility to say, I serve in submission to the lordship of Jesus Christ. And when we recognize that Jesus is Lord, what happens, church, is it begins to change how we steward our lives. For so many of us, we, I might include it, we like to be in control. We like the five-year plan. We like to have a sense of where we're going and what we're doing. And, and sometimes as college students, you feel panicked because every adult that you know is asking you, what do you want to do with your life? And you're like, I have no idea. And the panic ensues because there's this pressure that we should have things figured out. But what if we recognize the Lordship of Jesus and we said, Lord, in every arena of my life, I want to surrender it to you my vocation and my occupation, my career. Jesus, it's yours. Would you open doors as you see fit and would you close doors as you see fit? Jesus, my, my finances, they're, they're not mine to do what I want with. If I am a servant under the lordship of Jesus, my resources financially are under his uh, uh, ownership. I'm just a steward. And so it's a question of Jesus, how would you have me steward the resources you've blessed me with? Everything that I have, Lord, is under your authority. It's no longer my plan, my purpose, my agenda. Everything in my life is surrendered to the agenda and the authority of Jesus. And so what I love for James is he says, I am a servant of God. I'm under the lordship of Jesus, uh, Jesus Christ. And notice like this is the second title. Christ is not Jesus' last name. This is an official title in the Greek language. The word Christ means Messiah or anointed one. And what's interesting is James is writing to the 12 tribes. He's writing to Jewish Christians. And the Jewish people have been waiting for the Messiah. They have been longing for the servant of God who would come and set Israel free and would restore the kingdom of God. And, and James says, I am a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He acknowledges that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the anointed one. And I believe that what James is doing is declaring his hope resides in Jesus alone. Now, as, as the letter of James unfolds, what you'll find is that the community that James is writing to, they are facing persecution. They are facing struggle and challenge at every step of the way. And even in James' letter, this is a moment of, of uh, encouragement and a moment of hope where James says, listen, I know this is hard, but I write to you as one who's under the authority of Jesus, serving his plan and purpose, and I acknowledge him as Messiah, the one where our true hope resides. And even in the greeting of his letter, James is teaching this community of believers, put your hope in Jesus. He is the anointed one. He is the Messiah. He is the one that we've been waiting for. And church, I fully believe that the fullness of life is found when we live in submission to the lordship and to the authority of Jesus. Now, secondly, uh, vital sign check, who are you serving and what are you seeking? When we follow James' wisdom, it's uh, secondly this, we need to live counterculturally as the people of God. 
We need to live counterculturally as the people of God. And what I mean by counterculturally is this. Culture has a flow. There is a stream of thought. There is a cultural ideology and a way of living. A culture that would tell you, here's what happiness and fulfillment looks like. The problem is what culture prescribes is 180 degrees off from what the Bible calls us to. And when we live counterculturally, what we do is we refuse to live according to the values and ideologies of culture and instead say we are going to live our lives rooted in biblical truth, submitted to the lordship of Jesus, which puts us at odds with culture. So as James writes, let's just go back to verse 1-1. He writes to the 12 tribes and notice he says they are scattered among the nations. And as James writes this letter, again, to Jewish Christians, he goes, I recognize that you are scattered all over the world. And they are navigating the the intricate realities of living in a bunch of different cultures. And as James writes this letter, he writes to them to say, you might be scattered in all of these countries, but I want to bring you back to the truth of Jesus Christ. And I want you to be rooted in the reality that you were to live according to the culture of the kingdom of God as found in Scripture aligning your life under the authority and the lordship of Jesus. And as you do that, you will live in a counter-cultural way because the values of the kingdom of God are at odds with the values of culture. And what we think is that culture will make us happy. And as James writes this letter, he goes, no, 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 I'm living under the lordship of Jesus. He is the one in whom our hope resides. As you live as a scattered people, here's how you live out the culture of the kingdom. The rest of the book of James then is, here's how you live vibrantly with a a spiritual life that is full of life. Here's what it looks like. And so we're going to spend the next 10 weeks looking at the book of James and what he describes as a vital and vibrant way of living. But what strikes me is as you read James chapter one, let's start in verse two. We'll read a chunk of this. James says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Now, right away, I think we can safely say that's not a cultural value. I'll call to our culture says trials. That's bad. Get out of that. James says, consider it pure joy because when you're facing trials and likely they were facing trials because of their faith, he says, you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And so James says, you're facing trials, but this is part of the work of God's maturity in your life. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. And so again, as James writes to these believers scattered throughout the world, he goes, if you don't have wisdom, ask God. See, our tendency is to, we lack wisdom. We go, I'm going to ask culture. What does culture say about how I should live? James says, you lack wisdom, ask God. God will give you wisdom generously. He says, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Verse 9, believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. But the rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossoms falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade even while they go about their business. Now, I don't believe that James is saying all wealth is bad. Verses 9 through 11, I believe what James is saying, when you read chapter 2, what you find is that the rich and the powerful in this culture were oppressing the Christians. In chapter 2, James will talk about how they're the ones dragging the believers into court and suing them. And so James says, you're going to look at the world around you as this community of believers scattered among the nations, and you're feeling the oppression, and you're in this humble position. But notice what James says in verse 9, believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. In other words, James says, the values of the kingdom of God are reversed from the values of culture. We've been trained to think that power, status, and possession is where uh, your influence resides. James says, no, it's not. That's, that's not the value of the kingdom. When you are in a humble position, suffering for your faith, that is actually a place where God is forming you and shaping you. That is an exalted position in the kingdom of God. And, and that blows my mind. But what James is trying to do is to help these believers understand you were to live in a countercultural way rooted in the words and truth of Scripture. And so third, this is connected with this idea, third is our hope and identity have to be rooted in Jesus. 
This is a key part of this vital sign check question. Who are you serving and what are you seeking? This is, this is a really huge identity question. And our identity, who we are, and what brings us value and worth, our hope and identity have to be rooted in Jesus. Now, let me uh, break this down for us a little bit. Uh, I think there's three core questions when we talk about identity that are, that are really important to address. So we'll throw these up over here. Who am I? What do I value? And what is true? The way that you define these questions will shape how you live. So think about it for a second. Who are you? What, what do you value? What, what do you find really important? What do you believe to be true? Because how you answer this question is going to shape the trajectory of your life. And, and, and I think what's so tempting and, and what James, I believe, is writing to encourage the believers to do, what is tempting is to define these culturally. What, what does culture say about me? Do the things that make you happy. Do the things that will bring you fulfillment, whether or not they're right or wrong. If it makes you happy, then do it. And, and, and the idea is that if I live out of that identity, then that will fulfill me and make me happy. But if it's not rooted in the ultimate truth of God's word, it'll only lead to brokenness. So I think often what our culture does is it tries to circumvent these questions and our culture wants to put pressure on these things. Your occupation is your identity. It's the title that you have on your door. It's the amount of success you've been able to achieve and, and connected with that, it's, it's reputation. What, what do people say about you? Or maybe it's the things that we own. It's this sense of I've arrived at a successful place because I have the right title and I've climbed the ladder of success and people speak well of me and, and I have a lot of nice things. Now, none of these are sinful. A great occupation is a blessing from God. To be able to be blessed with financial means and possessions is a gift from God. To have a great reputation is a thing of honor. The problem is when these become the only measure of our identity. See, then what happens is we spend our time and energy serving at the altar of cultural success. And what happens is these things become idols. And for some of us where reputation is the thing, for some of us, you've lived your life as a people pleaser trying to get people to think well of you. And actually, rather than living in freedom, you're living in bondage of, I need to do and be what people want me to be, even when you sacrifice your own values just so they'll speak well of you. That, that's bondage. That, that, that's oppression. This is not living and walking in freedom. If possessions are the things that drive you, you will extend yourself and you will go into debt to acquire things and stuff so that on the cultural scorecard, it looks like you're ahead. What I want to suggest to us is three biblically rooted questions. And I think this is where James takes us. True identity is I live out what Jesus says about me that I am a sinner who stands in need of grace and Jesus can bring forgiveness. It is I value what Jesus values. And, and I believe this is a core part of the book of James, that he says you need to see that the values of the kingdom of God are different than cultural values. Where God has brought you into a place of struggle and trial, what, what James calls in verse 9 a humble position, he says you should take uh, 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 pride in your high position. Culturally, it looks like you're being oppressed and you're facing trial and it's hard. Yes, but James says this is actually a really good thing that God is doing in your life. Third it is, I am walking in biblical truth. And, and I believe that it answers those core identity questions in a way that is rooted in the identity of Jesus. And so if we really live submitted to the lordship of Jesus, it means that my occupation, my reputation, and the things that I have, all of those are surrendered to Jesus. They are no longer the measure of my worth. They are resources that I steward under the lordship, under the authority, and in submission to Jesus, who is both Lord and Savior. And I believe that walking here actually brings truth, because where these keep us chained at the culture, at the altar of cultural success, these free us up to walk in the words, ways, and wisdom of Jesus in a way that is not oppressive. I think of... Psalm 39, where David writes these words. And, and David, by the way, is king of Israel, right? And, and David has status as the king. David has wealth. David has authority. And listen to what David writes, Psalm 39, verse 4. Show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. You've made my days a mere handbreadth. The span of my years is as nothing before you. Everyone is but a breath. 
There's something sobering about this, right? Where James says, listen, the, the length of life is short. And, and, and he says, even those who seem secure, and, and he's looking around him going, there's some people who seem secure, right? Life is working out the way that they want it to. They are financially secure. They are stable. And he says, but even those who seem secure and feel like they have it all together, their life is still short. So David says this in verse six, he says, surely everyone goes about like a mere phantom in vain. They rush about heaping up wealth without knowing whose it will be. Verse seven, he says, but now Lord, what do I look for? He says, my hope is in you. And it's this moment where David, as a man who has power and authority and influence and wealth, he doesn't say that wealth is wrong. What he says is when you make it the chief end of your life, in vain, you will search after something that you think will bring you hope, but it never will bring you hope. David says, my hope is in you alone, Lord. I've I've heard this said several different ways. I don't even know who said it, but that there's nothing worse than climbing the ladder of success only to find that your ladder was leaned up against the wrong wall, that we've pursued the wrong things. So again, in in those cultural questions, to have a great job and earn an income and, and to have a great reputation, none of those things are wrong, but that cannot be where our hope resides. And what I want us to do, church, is as people living and walking as believers in Jesus, to live submitted and surrendered to the lordship and the authority of Jesus. And so students, maybe you're in college and you're trying to figure out what does my life look like? So many of your decisions are run through this rubric of what's going to make me happy, what's going to make me a lot of money, and what's going to make me secure. Not bad questions, they're just incomplete. You need to begin asking this question, how does God invite me to live according to the ways of the kingdom? What would change if I submit my plan for my future to the Lordship of Jesus and say, Lord, I'm pursuing engineering. How would you have me steward this in a way that brings glory to you? Lord, my occupation patient is yours. Maybe you're, you're an adult who's in your 40s and 50s and you have climbed the ladder and you're in uh, upper management, you're in the C-suite and there's this moment where you go, I've kind of arrived. I've got the corner office, I've got the windows, I've got a team that I lead. The question is not, is that bringing you joy? The question is, will you submit that to Jesus and say, Lord, how do I steward this for your glory? Because it's not yours, it never was. That position of influence is a gift of God's grace in your life. Surrender it back to him. Maybe you're in retirement and and you feel the sense of security and that your retirement account is is built up and it's going well, but maybe you live in constant fear of, well, what if the market tanks? Would you surrender that to Jesus and say, Lord, I'm appreciative of what you've blessed me with, but it's all yours and I trust you to care for it better than I. And what I think, church, is that actually brings freedom. I think of the words of David, but now, Lord, where do I look? My hope is in you. And when I talk about living under the lordship and the authority of Jesus, what I'm really talking about, church, is an identity and a hope rightly rooted in Christ alone. Any place else that you put hope outside of Jesus will fail you and will disappoint you. May our hope be in Jesus alone, and may we live surrendered and submitted to his lordship. So, two reflection questions. Again, who are you serving and what are you seeking? Is it Jesus? Is it success? Is it the accumulation of stuff? Number two, is there an area of your life that you need to surrender to Jesus? That even now, as we've been talking, you're going, man, I've been holding on to this part of my life, trying to retain control, but I know that I need to surrender it to Jesus. Part of my prayer is that this would be a surrender to Jesus moment. And let me say this, our fear in surrendering it to Jesus is we're afraid he's gonna take it away. But what if in surrendering to Jesus, you actually find the freedom to steward the blessings that God has given you in a way that's not oppressive because your hope is rightly rooted in the only one who can bring hope. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for the truth of your word. And God, I thank you for James and his letter to the early believers. And God, if I'm honest, there's parts of James that I I don't like because it's hard. And James says hard things. And yet I recognize in the hard things that James is going to say to us that there's truth and there's life and there's hope. And honestly, Jesus, the things that I find in James that are hard, they're hard because they push back on my own brokenness and my own sinfulness. And so God, I I pray that as we walk through this over the next 10 weeks, God, would you give us an openness and a receptivity to the truth of your word? 
because Jesus, we believe that, that you have hope and you have life. And, and Jesus, I'm thinking of this moment in the gospels where many, many deserted you and you look to your disciples and you ask them, are you going to desert me too? And the disciples look at you and they say, Lord, where would we go? Because you have the words of life. And so Jesus, I pray that in that we would be reminded and encouraged that in you and you alone are the words of life and truth. And Lord, may we place our hope in none other than you, Jesus. Sometimes it's tempting to to place our hope in ourselves, to have things under control, to have everything just rightly managed. And so we, we spend our life in fear and depression and anxiety, trying to control all the things. But Jesus, would you grace us to open our hands to you and say, Lord, all that you've blessed me with, I am simply a steward of. My hope is in you, Jesus. You are Lord. And in that, Father, may we find actually new life that it's not all up to us, that Jesus, you are both Lord and Messiah, and you are a Messiah and a Lord who is more than worthy of being both trusted and praised. So grace us, Jesus, to go all in in following you, that we might be a people who are spiritually healthy and mature in you, Jesus. We love you. We thank you for your grace and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.